So I'd like to give a great welcome to our audience uh, from the Don Jay community, from the faculty, um, the administrators uh, who supported this event, um, and also to the students who've made it and who will be coming, um, and also to the support um, to the support of the technical services or audiovisual services, um, food and the lovely refreshments that we have set up, and also um, the IT and marketing team that have ma made it possible for the live stream to happen, which means that we can also um, welcome an audience that we can't see, uh, but who can see us uh, through live stream. So um, I know that people are joining us from around the world and also here from New York City. Um, uh, in addition, um, great thanks to the Anya and Andrew Shiva Gallery, um, uh, especially to the director, Professor Bill Penburn, and to the gallery assistant, Marina Leibishke, who um, have done tremendous amount of work to bring this to us, to bring this event to bear, and also to the, ex to the creation of the exhibition, um, which we are here to uh, to discuss, to put into context, and um, and to really raise a lot of relevant issues about. Um, the exhibition title, um, which is very much in tandem with our discussion today, is Bearing Witness, Art and Resistance in Cold War Latin America. Um, and our esteemed panelists will be taking up different themes in connection with this. Um, using their professional and their life expertise. Um, so we're very excited to hear from them. Um, I'll be introducing them individually as we go along. Um, I also wanted to uh, say special thanks to the art and music department and particularly Roberto Rosani, Professor Rosani. Um, I wanted to make a special mention to some folks who can't be here with us, but without whose contributions this work, uh, this exhibition would not have been possible. Um, and that's Veronica De Negri, uh, the mother of R Rodrigo Rojas, um, whose three photographs are featured as part of the exhibition and who was brutally killed um, by the military dictatorship in Chile. Um, who wasn't able, uh, Veronica was not able to join us this evening, um, but is uh, definitely supporting uh, this event. And without her contributions, uh, we wouldn't have been able to have Rodrigo Rojas's photographs and his memory uh, as part of the exhibition. I also wanted to say um, a special mention to Juan Carlos Cáceres, who's also uh, our featured photographer uh, as part of the exhibition, who is hopefully watching us live from um, Santiago in Chile. Um, and um, in case they're joining us this evening, we're very hopeful that we have a representative from the cultural section of the Chilean consulate with us this evening. Thank you very much for your support. And Javier Paz Parada, who is the Chilean uh, cultural attache to the United States, um, will also be joining us this evening, hopefully. So we want to thank them in advance for their presence and their support of our work. And a last word um, to the co-curators of the exhibition, um, who are uh, Estrita Brodsky, um, Roberto Vestani, um, and Pierre Yves Brino, where are you, Pierre? behind the camera, um, who've been a pleasure to work with um, and are responsible for this uh, exhibition coming into play. And my last brief words will be just to say that this exhibition has grown um, from a really humble uh, one or two page proposal started a year and a half ago, hoping to show some images that commemorate the 40th anniversary of the coup d'etat that occurred on September 11th, 1973, that brought down uh, Salvador Allende's democratically elected government and brought in a General Augusto Pinochet's long-lasting and brutal military dictatorship. So the idea was to show some photographs of people resisting to to something that seems so overwhelmingly um, present. And that was the idea, and it grew into a traveling exhibition that has lasted at this point a year. This, um, when the proposal was first 
accepted. We showed at the Center for Worker Education, which is a division of City College. Um, and that was a really exciting moment because we were able to start with September 11th, the actual 40th, 40th year anniversary. And then we moved to a small cooperative photo gallery in Soho, um, recomposing the exhibition. And when it came to the Shiva Gallery, it grew into a large interdisciplinary humanist and arts collaboration by joining with works from other countries besides Chile and bringing together these themes of historical memory and resistance. Um, so with that in mind, um, I'd like to turn the podium over to our esteemed panelists. Um, we'll begin with um, We'll begin with Professor Marcia Esparza, um, who is the founder of the Historical Memory Project, who has been um, the, um, the driving force behind this ye over year long project. And I will let her introduce herself and the subject of her talk. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Lydia, and thank you always for your commitment to the project and for bringing historical memory from Latin America, remembering the Cold War years, um, to the college, to CUNY, and to New York City. Um, I will give a brief overview from a sociological perspective. Um, my work is very interdisciplinary, but I'm rooted in sociology and in historical sociology, particularly. The title of my presentation today, to give you all an overview, is called From Ferguson to Middle East to Ukraine and the Cold War in Latin America, Resemblance of Humanity. I'm sorry, Lydia, are you timing? Okay, <laughs> I don't want to go over. Okay, so in light of the recent wake of tear gassing against protesters in Ferguson after the killing of Michael Brown, the war in the Middle East, and the conflict in Ukraine, this is a timely event about political violence in Latin America. The current exhibition, Bearing Witness, forces us to address the relationship between state violence, militarization, and poverty-stricken communities. Let us not forget that Latin America is, according to many United Nations reports, one of the poorest regions in the world. But as I like to remind my students, it is not that the countries are poor. Indeed, they are not. Rather, people are made poor by the conditions of oppression created for them. By remembering Latin America's experience with madness, in the words of Gabriel Garcia Marquez referring to the surrealist conditions of coexistence with the horrors of war. We also remember the killing of one point million Armenians in 1911, the 8,000 Muslim men killed in Bosnia in 1994, or the six million Jews in addition to other minority groups during the Holocaust. Thus, ultimately, this exhibition and conversation are about humanity. They force us to confront the evil of war, but they also force us to re-examine the multiple righteous acts which take place as crimes against humanity unfold. As the courageous work of photographers Juan Carlos Cáceres and Rodrigo Rojas de Negri reminds us, even when faced with extreme forms of violence, there is resilience and the upsurge of organized protests, which I remember all too well, since during the heights of the resistance against Pinochet in 1986, I left Chile to immigrate to New York City. Claims of genocide and crimes against humanity have been invoked in the last months in the case of Gaza. These are international crimes that we examine here at John Jay from the perspective of international human rights law. Accordingly, the practice of torture, for example, revealed to us in La Tortura, is considered crime against humanity. Defined as those heinous crimes, 
committed as part of a widespread or, syst or systematic attack directed any, against any civilian population. As a result, torture defined as degrading and inhumane acts is now part of the International Criminal Court, Article 5 of the, of the Statute of the International Criminal Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia and Article 5 of the Law and Establishment of the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia. Through art, history, philosophy, anthropology, political science, literature, Latino, Latin American studies, and international criminal justice, we also teach about the Cold War years. This was a time when military coups swept Latin America as US-backed national armed forces fought a real or imaginary internal enemy to defeat armed or popular movements demanding the radical transformation of exclusionary socioeconomic systems. According to political scientist Patrice McSherry, the geopolitical reality of US influence and superpower status led the US to implement counterinsurgency training of military and police forces helped to foster politicized and aggressive attitudes in the military. The infamous School of the Americas, as scholars have shown, is only one of the many sites of military training of Latin American officers who have committed heinous acts of violence against, most frequently, their own fellow countrymen, women and children, in the name of national security. As a result, a generation of young leadership, workers, students, artists, intellectuals committed to social justice were targeted as tortured extrajudicial killings and enforced disappearance were sanctioned in dealing with political opponents. To emphasize, this leadership represented the interest of the popular classes, the subaltern, as defined by Gramsci and post-colonial studies. It is in this context that we need to locate an in-depth examination of crimes against humanity and resistance in Brazil and Chile. In Brazil, the military rule from 1964 until 1985, and in Chile, General Augusto Pinochet's dictatorship lasted, as Lydia said, from 1973 until 1990. According to Brazil Nunca Mais, Brazil never again, some 20,000 people were tortured, and in Chile, the Vale Commission documented 30,000 30, people. Most strikingly about the legacies of madness, the behavior of the military and human rights crimes is that they don't end long after military conflicts are over. For example, in Brazil, Human Rights Watch has repeatedly denounced that since 2010, security forces continue to engage in cruel treatment against people in their custody. And this, despite Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff, herself a human rights victim, signing into law a bill creating a national mechanism to prevent and combat torture in August 2013. In Chile, the Comité Ético Contra la Tortura, led by Juanita Aguilera, also a victim of torture, has recently denounced that the practices continue to be utilized by the Chilean militarized police. This brings me to another reason why this is a timely event. The recent arrest of two military officers charged with the killing of Chilean folk singer and playwright Victor Jara, whose mem memory is immortalized by Ivan Navarro's art. Jara's immensely humane art represented the Latin American musical movement known as Nueva Canción or New Song. Jara was detained on September 11, 1973, when soldiers assaulted the State Technical University, UTEM, now USASH, and took Jara and other faculty and students resisting the coup d'etat that overthrew Salvador Allende. A few days later, Jara was found dead near the Metropolitan Cemetery. I previously mentioned the righteous acts that take place in the midst of horror. horror. Jara's case serves to illustrate this point. When thousands of communist suspects were rounded up, 
Hector Herrera Olguin from the office, office responsible for identifying cadavers by contrasting dactylar fingerprints with birth certificates identified Jara and took the initiative to tell Joanne Turner, Jara's wife. By telling her about her husband's death, Herrera committed a righteous act and since Jara's body was recovered, Victor Jara is not a desaparecido such as the thousands and thousands of those illegally detained who are still unaccounted for, for whom their families still search across Latin America. At the Estadio de Chile, where Jara was held, some 5,600 prisoners were brought in public buses and military trucks, resources comprising the logistics of death and torture. The mass detention in the stadium soundly resonates with the roughly de relief rounding up the Jewish population in the third arrondissement from the center of Paris between July 16 and 17, 1942. It also resonates with death and labor camps during the Holocaust, such as Dachau, which I visited last August while at the University of Constance. Like in Chile, that they need names and political affiliations were recorded. Thus, against the background of militarization in Ferguson, wars, wars in the Middle East, and legacies of the Cold War in Latin America, there is a strong evidence of hope in humanity as we bear witness to human rights crimes that assault our morality. More recently, for example, in Argentina, the recovery of the grandson, grandson of Estela Barnes de Caloto, the president of the Asociación de Abuelas, searching for the kidnapped babies born in captivity, is just one example of hope. And we must hold on to these examples and remain hopeful as we stand against war and the use of military force to resolve deep-seated historical conflicts, whether in Ferguson, the Middle East, or in Latin America. With this in mind, I invite you all to bear witness to the Cold War years in Latin America. Thank you all for being with us today here. Thank you, Marcia. Marcia is Associate Professor of Criminal Justice uh, here at John Jay, because I didn't mention this earlier, so just in <laughs> case you want to catch up with her, um, she has an office right here on campus um, and is always ready to talk about bearing witness and historical memory, trust me. Um, <laughs> uh, next, uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Jeffrey Bluestein, who is the Arthur Zittrin Professor of Bioethics and Professor of Philosophy at the City College and at the Graduate Center, CUNY. Um, he has two books on issues related to ethics of memory, uh, The Moral Demands of Memory, which was selected as the Choice Outstanding Academic Book, um, in, published by Cambridge in 2008, and another book, Forgiveness and Remembrance, just recently published by Oxford University Press. Thank you, for Pro Professor Bluestein, for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Is this OK? OK. Um, the title of my talk is uh, Bearing Witness, Its Meaning and Value. I thought it might be helpful, given the title of this uh, exhi exhibit, to make a few comments about what it means to bear witness and why it's something that is so vitally important to us and so valuable to us. As a moral philosopher, that's what I am, this is what I do. I do two things, generally. I try to provide clarification of the basic concepts in terms of which we do our ethical analyses and make our ethical judgments. And with this as a point of departure that hopefully we can all agree on, I then turn to examine the values and norms that ought to structure our thinking about the topic under consideration, the topic today being the nature of bearing witness. So I'm going to divide my talk into two parts. One, I'm going to focus first on what bearing witness is. We hear the term used a great deal. It's the title of this exhibit. Um, and I think it's important to try to nail it down a little bit and see just what, uh, what the concept involves. And then when that's done, and hopefully that's been clarified, 
um, I'm going to talk some about the moral value and moral importance of bearing witness, something that I'm sure we all do believe it has. So let me start with some clarification in terms of the concept of bearing witness. In my view, bearing witness, uh, this is kind of boiling it down to a very basic outline and I can elaborate later in, in uh, any comments or questions you might have. It contains uh, three, wit uh, three elements and I wanna briefly flag what those elements are and then I'm gonna ask you, uh, in your own minds and in conversation after to test out the relevance of these points that I'm trying to make to the exhibit that we are uh, speaking about today. So the first idea that I wanna present is what I call testimonial authority. Those who bear witness provide testimony. They testify to something. The photographers and the multimedia artists in this exhibit testify both to the brutal tactics of oppressors in Latin America during the Cold War years and to the acts of resistance against them. While testimony is often delivered through what philosophers call speech acts or in the form of memoirs or historical narratives, it need not be. Indeed, as this exhibit so amply and powerfully demonstrates, the arts, whether visual, decorative, or performing arts, can be a much more powerful means of providing it, or at least uh, of providing this testimony. In addition, second part of this first point, those who bear witness do so from a position of authority they are taken to have, or at least take themselves to have, the moral authority to testify. What might actually give a testifier the moral authority to testify is an interesting and extremely important question and one that I think deserves a lot more attention from moral philosophers than it has received. In the case of bearing witness to wrongdoing, which is what we're talking about here, one source of authority is certainly the first-hand experience of it. Those who have suffered, we think, rightly I believe, have special authority to bear witness to the wrong that caused it, and perhaps to suffering more generally. And they are owed what we call moral deference because of their experience in part because their experience has give them, given them a certain epistemic advantage over those who have not suffered, and in, and in part because it is a mark of respect for them to show them this deference. Others, too, may have the authority to testify to events of which they had no firsthand experience. Now, our photographers did have firsthand experience of these events, but it is not necessary for a testifier to have first-hand experience. Friends, family members, members of the same community, they may have suffered themselves as what we call secondary or tertiary victims, or they may have inherited the authority to testify from those who have suffered more directly. So that's the first point testimonial authority, two parts. Those who bear witness provide testimony, which can be uh, verbal, written testimony, oral testimony, can be artistic testimony, and they have some moral authority to testify. The second idea is the idea of, in the idea of bearing witness is that it is an act of communication to an audience. Put somewhat differently, it is a mode of address. The psychiatrist Dori Laub, who has listened to many stories of Holocaust survivors, puts it this way, quote, testimonies are not monologues. They cannot take place in solitude. The witnesses are talking to somebody, unquote. The somebody, may not always be readily identifiable, and it may even change over time. 
There may be several audiences at once. The audience might not even yet exist. It may only exist in the future as something hoped for and addressed to it may be motivated not so much by a belief in the likelihood that someone will actually hear the testimony, but more by hope that someone may. But whether real or imagined, stable or fluctuating, multiple or singular, local or universal, the one who bears witness always possessions him or herself before an audience to which the testimony is directed and with which he or she is engaged. It is not bearing witness merely to relate one's experience. So I ask you to think, who is the audience for this exhibit? The third aspect of the concept of bearing witness is the fact that the audience is in need of the testimony that the witness provides, and perhaps that only the witness can provide. Witnesses are responding to at least a perceived need in the audience they're addressing. There are many reasons why an audience might need the testimony. It can have, testimony can have an archival function. It may supply an audience with information about past events that are not adequately known or are denied or are likely to be forgotten. Information that is morally or historically or socially significant enough, significant enough that things, these things ought not to happen. So I ask you, why does, this, why, do, why does the audience for this exhibit need this exhibit? Now the second part of what I want to comment on, now that we have more sharply defined, I think, what bearing witness is, and I know this is terribly abstract, but I think you can fill it out quite easily by placing these comments in the context of this exhibit. I want to turn to what may be of greater interest to us here, namely why is bearing witness not just a neutral recounting of past events, but an act imbued with moral value? Part of the answer certainly appears to what moral philosophers call consequentialist thinking. The person who bears witness to wrongdoing, the artist, the writer, public speaker, provides testimony an audience needs, presumably because without it, future wrongdoing will be more likely. Nunca mas, nunca mas. Why do we say nunca mas? Because we don't want these things to happen again. We see the photos in this exhibit. We see the, multi the multimedia exhibits. We're filled with rage. And hopefully we come away resolved that those who resisted oppression and injustice shall not have suffered or sacrificed or died in vain, to paraphrase Lincoln's words. But I also think part of the answer relates to the witness him or herself. There is a sense that the one who bears witness is a good or better person for having done so. Even if the testimony has little impact on future wrongdoing, why? The victimization and misfortune of others cannot be undone or compensated for by the artists and writers who bear witness to it. And this is something I am sure that the witnesses are often acutely and painfully aware of. They may experience distress, but the distress is not just a psychological reaction. It may also be a function of provide evidence for their, their commitments, the value of which cannot adequately be accounted for in terms of the consequences it may bring about for future wrongdoing. In other words, there is something intrinsically valuable about the affirmation itself, some goodness that is expressed thereby in the one who bears witness the philosopher Robert Maryhew Adams uses the wonderful expression being, quote, for or against 
the good and the bad, unquote. In these terms, the one who bears witness does not just testify about something, but for or against something, against injustice and impunity, for the protection of human rights, for reparations for victims. The moral value of bearing witness, then, is in part a symbolic act that expresses one's intrinsically valuable allegiance to the good and a repudiation of the bad. There are many ways that we can be for morality. Bearing witness to wrongdoing is one of the most effective and transformative. The final point, when the witness is one who has suffered wrongdoing, there is an additional argument for its moral value, I think. People who have undergone brutal, humiliating, or degrading treatment are often traumatized by it and find it difficult to speak out about what they have suffered. They suffer often in silence. Those who have not experienced what they have experienced may, out of a sense of guilt or discomfort, avoid or marginalize them. But if, despite the emotional risks and psychological distress, the survivor of trauma is able to bear witness to what she has undergone, and importantly, her testimony receives acknowledgement and validation from others, the survivor may find relief from painful and humiliating memories. Moreover, by summoning the strength to bear witness, she issues a demand to be heard as a person in possession of the truth about what took place and the right to tell it. By acceding to this demand, by giving respectful attention to her testimony, to her bearing witness, the audience affirms what was earlier denied, namely her status as a moral agent. Thank you. Professor Bluestein. Um, so um, I'd like to introduce Professor Siriaco Lopez, who is a professor of photography here at John Jay, um, and also an, a photographer and an artist, uh, winner of the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis Project Award in 2003, the World Studio Foundation Award in 2001, and the Phillips Prize for Trip to Europe in 1997. Um, he is um, his work has been shown at the National Museum of Fine Arts in Brazil, the, Mo the Museums of Modern Art in Rio and in Salvador, and the Sao Paulo Art Museum. And in the US, he's also appeared at the Contemporary Art Museums in Baltimore and St. Louis, and at El Museo in NYC. Um, he's, he, um, we have the pleasure of having him um, here on our panel, and I'd like to point out that he's um, He's known as one of the few artists of his generation in Brazil, and this is from his statement, uh, that consistently is vying with political issues such as the ones that we're speaking about today. And um, we want to applaud uh, the arts when they become uh, transgressors of boundaries um, in this politic and to engage the politics that are so important and that we're focusing on today. So thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Lydia. Could I use the projector? Could I project my, I have a few slides I'd like to show you. Just because there are two or three things I need to read from this slide, I will not know by heart. And in fact, even though um, I'm introduced as an artist, I will not talk about art, because I thought it would be more interesting. Well, because we have an amazing artist here, we have someone that will talk about art to us. And tomorrow we have 
uh, Professor Claudia Kalerman, who is a specialist in Brazilian art from the dictatorship, talking about this. I thought it would be more interesting to talk about the experience of uh, being born and raised in a dictatorship I as I was, in particular examples of popular culture. Do you know those crazy people that uh, they look at the crack in the wall and they say, oh, this is God talking to me? Or they, their toast is an alien that's trying to talk to me? That is how you are when you grow up in a dictatorship. Because the thing is, the dictatorship is everywhere, but you cannot say its name, so it's invisible. You can never address it. And it's the strangest thing because you cannot, you, the news don't talk about it, the newspapers don't talk about it, the magazines don't talk about it. You don't talk about it with your friends because very often there are informers, just like there were informers here, John Jay last year, and the Muslim Society. Uh, so it's how do you talk about what cannot be spoken? That subject is very interesting to me as an artist. Uh, as a gay person, I think it's, it's something that I'm very committed. And I decided to show you a few examples. So for instance, think, could you go to the next one, please? Thank you, Marina. So for instance, uh, the Brazilian dictatorship was the first in Latin America, no, as you know, the Cuban uh, revolution was in 1959. The US was very much afraid that the whole of Latin America would become communist and financed all these different dictatorships, Brazil, Argentina, uh, Chile, Uruguay. Brazil was 1964, but it really got worse on that day on this newspaper in which, the, is, which is 1968, in which the government uh, dissolved the Congress, forbade uh, political uh, meetings, forbade many parties. And the interesting thing for me is that the newspaper is giving this news, but they of course cannot make any uh, judgment of quality. However, could you see in the top of the newspaper, this was like the Times at the time, that was the most respected newspaper in Brazil at the time. Do you see that little square to the left up there? This is the weather report for the day. Let me read for you the weather report. And by the way, uh, weather and time are the same word in Portuguese, so you can, you can do this play of words. Um, dark times, suffocating temperature, Unbreathable air. The country is being swept by strong winds. Very hot in Brasilia, very cold in Rio, because in Rio was the resistance to the dictatorship. So, of course, they are talking about the thing without talking. And just by doing this, they are risking their lives. Uh, just, uh, even though they're going around, they're still risking their lives. And also, in this other little square to the right, as it happens the day before, had been the day dedicated to the visually impaired. And they put in, the, in that little headline, yesterday was the day of the blind. Mm -hmm. So of course, it's, it's again, it's the alien talking to you in the toast. You have to know what you're looking for to be able to read it. And this is everything in society. Could it? This is a poem, I will not read the whole poem, but it's a, it's a great Brazilian poet called Ferreira Goulart. He's always, the Brazilians always want him to win the Nobel and the Portuguese also. And it's a poem about a guy that's very tired, he's coming back home after a long day. And I'll just read for you the last stanza. I say goodbye to illusion, but not to the world, not to life, not to my place, not to my kingdom of the unjust wages, of the unjust punishment, of humiliation, of torture, of terror. We take something and with it we make something else. A poem, a flag. This poem is, is incredible because you're reading something very domestic, the guys in a bus going back to work and there is a moment in which it turns and it becomes a revolutionary poem. 
So the poem becomes, do you know, take the torture, change it, make a flag, make a new country, change the way that things are. Of course, he's writing this outside Brazil already at that moment. It's not, uh, it's veiled, but it's not as veiled that he would not have been jailed at the time. I get to one thing of each cultural expression. This is a play, it's a fantastic play. I actually don't know if it's translated to English. I should have checked. I love that play. Called Freedom, Freedom, Liberty, Liberty. And it's very smart. And then when you're in a dictatorship, you also become very smart. It's really good for <laughs> semiotics. If you like a an literary analysis, it's the best education ever. Because the guys are thinking, we're going to do a play against the dictatorship but you're not gonna write one line. Everything will be a collage of famous texts. So it's Plato, Socrates, Shakespeare, Jesus Christ. And they will not be able to censor us because of that. And just to give you a flavor, the play opened, and there was music also. It's also a musical, it was a very happy protest. Uh, but very anguished, of course. Uh, it opens with this song, which is actually a military marching band. The military love this, it's the antenna for the Republic. And it's this woman in the guitar alone, and she sings two verses of that antenna, which are, be our country triumphant, a free land for free brothers and sisters. This is a military song. But of course, she's using words to say something that's not written, which I think is one of the ways that we do art. It's one of the things art exists for. And then the chorus would come and would continue the song and would say, freedom, freedom, open your wings over us. Of fights, of storms, allow us to listen to your voice, the voice of freedom. It's, it's Amazing, the guy that did the college is, is an incredible intellectual that died just a few years ago. And it was a hit, was a big hit uh, at first, you know, because the people doing the dictatorship were not the brightest people. Let's, uh, I could give you many examples of them not being that bright. But eventually they would catch up and that was the case. There was a moment in which every time this play would be performed, the military police would go to the door because remember, they also want to see who is going to the play. Going to the play, as your talk was talking, the public is participant of the discourse. Just being present in that uh, play was a motive for the military to be um, concerned about you. Let's go to the next. Uh, and this is not uh, only talking, uh, talk about high culture, the great poet, the great playwright. But this was a soap opera. This actually was one of the most successful soap operas ever in the world. It's considered to be the most dubbed TV show ever. It was in 85 countries and so on. And it's called The Slave is Aura. It's a 19th century book. It was an abolitionist book. Uh, very bad book. It's, a, it's historically very important, but it's an unbearably bad book. And it was made in the soap opera, and which was this big hit in Brazil. And then one day the censor calls the author to talk to the author and says, do you know, people are talking about this thing, no? because you're doing a soap opera about slavery. People begin to think. So you are forbidden to say the word slave in a soap opera called The Slave is Aura. <laughs> <laughs> in the soap opera last six months, half of the characters are slaves the other half are the slave owners. In the six months, they could not say the word slave because the censorship thought would be too dangerous. And it shows how pervasive dictatorship is. I'm, of course, at this time, I don't know, four or five years old, this is 76. So I'm not even allowed to develop that skill of thinking about the oppression of the people in Brazil in the 19th century make a comparison with the people living at my time. No, it's, I'm, it's very different, the people that lost their freedom in 1964 and the people that were born and raised in a dictatorship that never had freedom, as I was, as my generation was. I have only two more things to show you, please. This is a movie and uh, we have never been so happy 
is the name of the move. And when I saw it, it's 84, which is the last year of the dictatorship, the main character is maybe 15. I was not too far from his age. I was in elementary school, he was in high school. And I'll just tell you the story. Uh, the, the boy is in the boarding school, his father comes, the father he has not seen for many years, out of the blue, picks him out of the boarding school, drives for hours. You can see, this is the scene, he torches their car at some point, they continue by bus, he put his son in an apartment, gives him some money, say, I'm gonna go to a meeting, I'll come back to tonight or maybe tomorrow. The less I tell you about me, the better for you. And then, this is, a, could you, yeah, could you go to the next? The whole movie is this guy walking through the apartment, this young boy, walking through the apartment, walking through the streets of Copacabana. And no one, and I guarantee you, most people in the cinema had no idea what's going on, which is very interesting, because when you live in a dictatorship, very often it's like a fish in a bowl. You're not aware of the bowl. It's only if you're uh, an intellectual or if you are very politicized. Most people are thinking what you are thinking right now. Who you want to sleep tonight? What food you're gonna have for dinner? And so on. And it needs this moment in which you are awakened. To me, it was a beautiful portrait of my generation. It's the generation that feels that there is something wrong, but can't really put their finger in what it is. And the film never, res never resolves. We never learned anything. The film ends just suddenly, the, guy, the boy is there in his apartment, you can see the money is ending up. You don't know what is gonna happen with him, with his father, with the country. And by the way, the name is because the Globo, which was the main TV channel, is still is the main TV channel in Brazil, which was the voice of the dictatorship, on that particular year had this slogan. Uh, no, 1983, we have never been so happy, which is debatable, I guess. Uh, and of course, this is the, the last example I want to show you. Tonight, uh, of course, if you meet every Brazilian, any Brazilian, they will tell you 35 songs that would fit well on this. Uh, Brazil has a very rich and sophisticated tradition in popular music. I just given this example because it's actually a line of the Bible. Father, uh, take away this chalice of me. You know, Jesus tell to God, uh, if I can, if you can make me not die in a horrible way, would be nice. If I have to, I will. And of course, will you going to censor Jesus Christ? Uh, but they did. That song was forbidden for five years. And one of the problems for the militaries, which they actually were kind of smart on this one, the word chalice, uh, which is chalice in English, the sound of it is exactly, in Portuguese, is exactly uh, be silent. So what they were really singing was about uh, father, take away censorship from me. And everyone knew that one. And everyone would sing and it's become a, a protest song. And that, that's why it was forbidden for many, many years and there were actually consequences for singers that recorded it. That, um, I'm, I'm finished, but there was a famous singer, Clara Nunes, who recorded that song without knowing that was political. And then she was called by the military and she said, what? Well, that is what the song is about? <laughs> and uh, if I, uh, I have two slides, uh, could you just briefly? This is the protests last year and you can see the same song. This is 35 years later. Young people are still using these and many other songs of the repertoire of protest. And the, but do you see this iPhone? This iPhone means democracy. This iPhone could not have happened in 73 when the song was first released. Now it's red, it's there for all the cameras to see. And the last uh, slide, please. And I want to show those two women for you because independently of what you think, I think, uh, to me, since I never had freedom, my life has been a bonus. Brazil has only gotten better from the time I, I came to, to the world. And I see this young girl, young woman that fought against the dictatorship, that was jailed, that was beaten up, she was punched, she was electrocuted, 
When she was in jail for many years, her marriage was destroyed by the dictatorship because her husband was also tortured, disappeared in many years without seeing each other. And then I look at the president of Brazil today, and when I think that they both can be the same person, I can only be thankful that there were those people that thought that we could have what we have today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lopez. Do you mind? Yeah, it's okay. Click on it. Actually, it will, it's not working. Pass it over for troubleshooting. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I don't know if any of you saw um, my, uh, I just want to take a little aside. I, I had this um, visceral reaction when um, that soap opera was mentioned. Um, and this speaks to actually what Professor Esparza was, was remarking on the globalization of mass atrocities and the way that, um, that things are, that seem so isolated in their local environment are actually exported, which is that I, growing up in the Soviet Union, watched that soap opera because it was dubbed and I actually have very, very uh, like visceral memories of it because we had, mm, two channels, so, and of course, the programming was very structured, and that was one of the programs that we watched as children. And I know I saw um, Marina had a similar reaction where, <laughs> did you really just mention that? <laughs> so, um, just wanted to make the connections. Um, so our, our next uh, esteemed panelist is um, independent curator and art historian, um, Dr. Brodsky, Estrellita Brodsky, uh, who um, besides having co-curated the exhibition that we're celebrating uh, tonight and that we're honoring, um, bearing, bearing witness, um, she's also been behind um, the exhibitions at, um, sorry, I'm losing, um, losing my place, uh, the 1997 exhibition of Taino, Pre-Columbian Art and Culture of the Caribbean at at El Museo del Barrio in New York City, if any of you caught that, that was a remarkable exhibition. Um, and her doctoral dissertation um, actually w uh, received the Outstanding Doctoral Dissertation Award in the field of Latin American Visual Culture from the Association of Latin American Art. So we have um, illustrious and very knowledgeable experts here with us today. And please Thank give her. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here and, and putting this together. I'm gonna see if this works, more importantly. Uh, does that, okay, okay, great. Uh, thank you, thank you, Lydia, and thank you for organizing this, all the people on the panel. It's, it's quite a triumph, you put this together quite quickly, and uh, it's been terrific up till now. Uh, the exhibition Bearing Witness, Art and Resistance in Cold War Latin America takes a critical look at the relationship between art and human rights and its ability to create historical memory. Addressing the inhumanity and atrocities that occurred during an intensely violent era in Latin American history, the works presented in the exhibition are particularly relevant today, as we've been talking about, in face of escalating threats to global reason. Bearing Witness asks whether a work of art can elicit a more direct reaction to injustices too often overlooked. Rather than exalting or aestheticizing atrocities, the artists in Bearing Witness confront us with a question, how are we responsible and complicit for injustices and violence that take place under our watch, whether we choose to see them or not? They expose the viewer to the brutality of realities that we as humans most often prefer to avoid believing that we, if we have not witnessed inhumanity firsthand, then it just didn't happen. By placing the viewer in a direct and intimately active relationship with images of and references to torture and political violence, the artists featured in this exhibit insist on making us see and react. The show presents a group the work by a group of international Latin American artists who specifically responded to the cultural and political repression suffered during periods of dictatorships in Cold War Brazil and Chile. In today's presentation, I'll give some background as to the evolution of the exhibition and then address what the different approaches taken by the artists. Much of my work is focused on Latin American artists living in post-World War II Paris. 
a number of these visual artists moved to Paris not only because they were attracted to the city as a cultural hub, but also because they wished to escape restrictive and often precarious political situations at home. It was at the urging of some of these artists, specifically by the Argentine artist Julio Lepard and the Brazilian figurative artist Gonfranguanais Neto that I came to work on this exhibition at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Best known for explorations with movement and light, primarily sculpture, Le Parc had left Paris in 1958 after having participated in, uh, in one of the major anti-militant uh, militant anti-government opposition. In Paris, he soon founded the artist collaborative group, Grave, Group de Recherche d'Art Visuel, and became internationally well known as a kinetic artist. Though stylistically diverse, Le Parc grounded these works and his work with Grave on politically provocative ideas of conferring creative responsibility onto the viewer, designating art as a tool for social change. Arriving in Paris a decade later than Le Parc, Contranguanais Neto sought exile after having been imprisoned and tortured by the Brazilian military police for anti-fascist activities. It was in Paris in 1972 that the two artists, Le Parc and Neto established the art collective La Denuncia, The Denouncement, along with Alejandro Marcos from Spain and Jose Gamara from Uruguay, with a common goal of exposing and denouncing the Brazilian military government's repressive actions, the artists produced the work shown today at John Jay College, La Sala Oscura de Tortura, or Dark Room of Torture. These artists stories speak to the fact that the resistance to an outcry against the Brazilian military subjugation of artists and intellectuals took place on many fronts, often crossing borders and continents. They became, became increasingly concerned by reports of widespread detentions, of assassination of students, intellectuals, politicians, and journalists, as well as artists, especially after the uh, infamous decree in 1968 of the Ato Institucional mentioned before, or AI-5 as it came to be known. By June of 1969, artists gathered in Paris agreed to boycott the 10th Sao Paulo Biennale in solidarity with Brazilian artists, declaring no a la Biennale de Sao Paulo. They were soon joined by artists in New York forming the Museo Latinoamericano and the splinter group Movimiento por la Independencia Cultural de Latinoamérica, producing the uh, Contra publishing a Contra Biennale that included the work of many artists condemning so, uh, the Brazilian dictatorship. Over 40 years later, in the, in the face of violence and injustices confronting us today, La Parque and Guanais Neto, well into their 80s, stressed the need to once again have the public recognize past and present travesties. Therefore, the works exhibition seems timely and relevant, especially to be shown at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, an educational institution dedicated to training future professionals in the field of criminal justice and public safety. With kind thanks to Ka Claudia Callerman, who put me in touch with fellow colleagues and curators at John Jay College, Roberto Bisani, Marcia Esparza, uh, Pierre Ivrino, and Lydia Shestapopova, as well as, of course, um, Marina and Bill in the gallery. The work by La Denuncia became part of a wider project alongside works by fellow Latin Americans who took equally confrontational approaches in documenting and building of a collective narrative of human injustice. I'll return to La Tortura later, but first I wanted to give an overview of some of the other works in the exhibition, those which responded specifically to Chile's brutal dictatorship under Pinochet from 73 to 90. They've been mentioned before, two, uh, two photo photographers who documented the increasing resistance taking place on the streets of Santiago de Chile, Juan Carlos Cáceres and Rodrigo Rojas de Negri. In the aftermath of Pinochet's uh, 73 coup and Allende's death, an estimated, um, I guess, quarter, uh, I didn't know whether to go over the figures again, but they're pretty impressive um, and uh, humiliating. Uh, estimated quarter of a million people were detained, 3,000 were killed or disappeared, and many thousand were tortured. Some years later, in 1981, Juan Carlos Cáceres started uh, recording the growing res resistance against the dictatorship, pro pro photographing the protests and movements calling for restoration. Over 
of, of democracy over the following 10 years. Cáceres registered the almost daily violence in photographs such as guards brutally beating a protester from 1983 or detained woman from 1986. In a similar fashion, the other uh, Chilean photographer on exhibit, Rodrigo Rojas de Negri, immersed himself within the local context. Returning to Chile in 1986 out of exile in the US, de Negri not only took part in the resistance, but also recorded the often violent confrontations, untitled from 1986 or during a protest also from 1986. Tragically, while taking part in one of the demonstration barricades, De Negri was himself arrested, beaten, and burned by government forces, dying from his so wounds soon thereafter uh, at the age of 19. Artist Lotti Rosenfeld engaged more actively in the public realm while documenting Chilean's plight firsthand, confronting unwitting participants in actions personal collective that demanded a reaction. Rosenfeld, in the work No Mas from 1983, with CADA members, uh, CADA, which was the Colectivo de Acciones de Arte, took their group's art into the unpredictable framework of the streets of Santiago de Chile as physical acts of resistance. Formed in 1979, CADA was an artist and activist collective. Combining conceptual practices and political propaganda, uh, tactics, as well as photojournalistic uh, approaches, the group developed a number of urban interventions that challenged political repression and solicited viewers' participation. Such was the case of No Mas, or no, no More, a series of street murals and graffiti disseminated around the streets of Santiago de Chile with fill-in blank protest slogan, No More, which the public rapidly took up and transformed into statements such as No More Torture, No More Fear, and No More disappeared. The anonymous slogans became enormously popular and were rapidly appropriated by various anti-Pinochet collectives and even used in various political rallies, most notably in the 1989 election campaign that through democratic process brought to an end Pinochet's military regime in 1990. Also included in the exhibition, Una Milla de Cruces, Sobre el Pavimiento from 1979 is arguably the most emblematic of Rosenfeld's work. Affixing pieces of white tape over the painted divisions of a Santiago roadway, Rosenfeld transformed the median strips into a succession of white cruciforms extending a mile, a simple yet powerful landscape intervention, effectively reoccupying the public space and filling the vista with a sea of crosses. Rosenfeld creates a subtle breach against social order and a disturbing reference to the missing headstones for victims disappeared or lost under the dictatorship, one that suggests the field of crosses in Normandy. In the video, Cautivos or Captives, Rosenfeld combines personal footage from earlier art interventions such as a mile of crosses on the road with famous TV news broadcasts. The video's disorienting amalgamation of se seemingly unrelated images and sounds offers a cautionary reflection on the news me media's ability to manipulate and be manipulated for political ends, holding us hostage or captive, as well as the captives shown. Made in 1989, at the end of Pinochet's regime, Cautivos includes clips from that year's breaking news broadcasts, including the presidential election result voting no against Pinochet, a highly emotional admish, admission of guilt by a Cuban colonel, and images of Karine Idol being publicly interrogated while in prison for her alleged involvement with an anti-government Manuel Rodriguez Front's kidnapping of a military leader. And the clip, the clip I'm going to show, Karen Idol's interrogator is questioning her and it's played over um, images of Rosenfeld's Mile of Crosses and an emotional admission of guilt by the condemned Cuban author, officer. You will hear these dissonant sound uh, la tracks layered one upon the other of disconnected images creating a sort of a somber dystopian connection between the captives, the exploit abuse abuses of power and the subservient complicit news media and the compromises of individual justice. Sí, 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 sí,
Nación Trump toma 61 votos aprobados. Adelante usted en el estudio se dice 10,4% rechazo, que está dando 85,58% de votos por la opción apruebo, 8,76% rechazo. Apruebo 208, rechazo 40, en blanco 430, apruebo 54, rechazo, en blanco a 20. In the 2008 Missing Monument for Washington, D.C., uh, Chilean-born Ivan Navarro, sitting on my right, which I'm a little cautious to go over, but um, it presents us with an equally poignant video installation that refers to the injustices suffered under Pinochet by uh, Victor Jara, who Marcel uh, already spoke about, uh, the, the well-known singer-songwriter. Although not just a child, when Pinochet overthrew Allende, uh, Navarro's memories of the regime's subsequent actions over the next two decades still resonate with him. According to Navarro, what he remembers most about his uh, youth was the fear of being disappeared, as many political dissidents, including friends and colleagues of his father, a university dean who sought exile in the U.S. soon after. Um, I'm going to show uh, another one of uh, Ivan's work in which he uses Nia at Neon light is a subtle, a subtle allusion to the precarious, often hazardous nature of truth and understanding. In this electric chair, references to the electric chair, a means of killing and, or torturing criminals, becomes a less than inviting modernist seat for the viewer. In Ma Mi Missing Monument, however, the political reference is directly made to Victor Jara, who was arrested, then tortured and killed in the Estadio Ch Chile. The National Stadium in Santiago began holding prisoners soon during the immediate aftermath of Pinochet's coup. Um, it became a mass, the first massive detention and torture camp controlled by the army where thousands of men and women were tortured and killed, as was Victor Jara. Navarro here presents us with two barefoot men in an empty room, dressed in dark clothes with white bags over their heads as if to be tortured or executed. One on all fours calls to mind the figure of a horse, while the other, with an acoustic guitar in hand, stands on his back strumming a single chord and reciting the passages from Victor Jara's last poem's song, smug smuggled out of the stadium after he was tortured, killed, and thrown into a mass grave. In contrast to Washington, D.C. memorials, the Vietnam veterans' memorials, silent wa wall of remembrance or the more grandiose monument to the Latin American liberator, Simon Bolivar, atop his horse. In Nevada's works, work, words spoken out loud articulate the terror and insanity suffered by those in prison, the horror of fascism, and the incredulity at what Jara witnessed in his own words. What I see, I have never seen. The posters on the strown on the floor printed with the words of Jara's unfinished work that are being recited by the hooded figures are there for the viewer to step on or pick up. One has little dis recourse than to engage with the work or to deliberately turn away. Either way, Navarro makes clear the complicit relationship between the passive spectator and his or her confrontation with injustice. The hooded figures and their positions are seen here. Somos cinco mil aquí en esta parte de la ciudad. Somos cinco mil. ¿Cuántos seremos en total en las ciudades y en todo el país? Somos aquí diez mil manos que siembran y hacen andar las fábricas. ¿Cuánta humanidad con hambre, frío, angustia, pánico, dolor, presión moral, temor y locura. Seis de los nuestros se perdieron en el espacio de las estrellas. Un muerto, un golpeado como jamás creí se podría golpear a un ser humano. Los otros cuatro quisieron quitarse todos los temores. Unos saltando al vacío, otros golpeándose la cabeza contra el muro. Pero todos, todos, con la mirada fija de la muerte. Sorry about the abrupt end, sorry, Ivan. 
Certainly the, the hooded figures in their positions recall the 2003-04 photographs of detainees being tortured and humiliated by U.S. military forces at Abu Ghraib, Iraq, along with the title, A Missing Monument for Washington, D.C., reinforced the notion that the U.S. Capitol shared responsibility for a missing monument to acknowledge its own role in disruptive and brutal histories, including uh, uh, Pinochet's 17-year dictatorship in Chile. So I don't have much time to return to my, my, uh, my friends uh, La Sala Oscuro, Oscura, but um, in fact, it, in, this, in a similar way, they seek to engage the viewer in witnessing and reacting to engage them in an active discourse to practices most often ignored. ignored. They base their, um, the work on the accounts recounted to them in detail by the exiled Dominican friar, uh, Tito de Alenzar de Lima, who had in 1969 been held and tortured in the infamous uh, de OPS, uh, Departamento Estadual de Orden Politica y Social de Sao Paulo. Uh, fleeing to Paris after his release, uh, the friar met with the La Denuncia artists and gave detailed accounts, which they reenacted, photographed, and then painted on the canvases, uh, now on view at uh, John Jay. Uh, and uh, the, the large, the human scale um, works and the evocation of a prison cell make it clear that they want us to feel that we are witnessing um, what, what these individuals suffered. And even though I could go on to make comparisons with other artists who depicted uh, horror and inhumanity, such as Picasso and Goya uh, in his uh, Disasters of War, presenting a record of the uh, inhumanity during the um, Napoleonic Peninsula Wars between France, Spain, and Portugal. Um, these are images that would resonate with the Goya, with the uh, La Tortura artists as well. And especially the idea that yo lo vi, that I saw it. Uh, I saw it myself, I was there, I saw these inhumane scenes, and I am a witness. Uh, certainly aware of these works, they also are, were aware of uh, of um, 17th and 18th century religious painting and um, also uh, uh, critical of the church which for many Latin American artists uh, presented uh, uh, a, an attitude towards torture that was less than um, uh, ideal. Uh, they criticized the church and its insistence on depictions of hell as a way of legitimizing the use of torture and terrorization rather than conveying any moral lessons, as did Leon Ferrari here. So in closing, I think it's fair to say that the exhibition um, Bearing Witness, Art and Resistance in Cold War Latin America takes on this question whether art can make us conscious of unjust practices while also making us cognizant of that self-awareness. A restructuring of one's ac uh, ac accountability or complicity in that history. And today, in a world where we risk becoming visually and mentally, mentally immune to injustice, in a world inundated with images of violence presented by journalistic media of actual events, as well as through the entertainment industry, movies, video games, and TV shows such as Games of Throne, Game of Thrones, the question posed by this exhibition is whether an artist's practice can engage us with the reality of inhumanity suffered by the victims of violence and repression through a dynamic process, one that establishes a fundamental empathy to what is humane. And in closing, absolutely, the words of La Denuncia artist, Monaes Neto, resonate in claiming that art is living proof of eternal memories and through active participation raise awareness and enrich the human condition. Almost half a century after its crea creation, this work, La Sala Oscura de Tortura, serves as a permanent form of denunciation. The role of the work, therefore, begins as an individual or group creation to inescapably become a collective force. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brodsky. And I should, I should mention that although, although we weren't able to get 
the full breadth of your expertise. We will have uh, some time um, after this this closing panel and after the questions to go check out the actual exhibit and to continue these conversations. So, and the gallery is staying open till, uh, I believe till 9 p.m., an hour later, is that, am I correct in saying that? Or did I just, did I just make that happen? Uh, <laughs> um, in any case, um, the exhibition will be open a little bit after the talk tonight <laughs> and, and we can negotiate how long. And then also it doesn't close on, formally until the 12th of September. So you have uh, till the end of the week to come back and see it in its full scale. Um, and Sudita will be at this event tomorrow, right? And we'll, we'll, make, we'll, make, we'll make announcements there regarding that one. There it is. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, and uh, last but certainly not least, we have um, a political transgressive artist who works with uh, multi <laughs> multimedia and who's already been introduced several times by our illustrious speakers, so I won't take any more time. Um, Ivan Navarro, please. But um, I thought that it could be a good idea to, instead of talking about my work, because um, Estrellita already did a great job. Thank you. And uh, I thought that could be a good idea and interesting also for the audience is to talk about the the day before of when Victor Jara went to Estadio Chile, the place where he was tortured and killed. Mm? So um, basically I'd like to talk why he was taken there mm? and uh, not just because he's an amazing uh, folk singer and a very important figure for the Latin American resistance, but also what exactly he was doing the day before he was taken to the to this um, stadium. So um, let's say um, some t uh, the coup um, dictatorship in Chile started um, September 11, right, 1973. So this event the image corresponded an event of September 9th <clears throat> in Santiago at the uh, Universidad Técnica that you mentioned before, mm, at the UT, or UTE, which is stand for Technical University. Um, so this day, um, everybody that worked at that university, especially the people who were involved in the artistic um, preparation of, of events, uh, were preparing this big, big exhibition uh, that was called Por la Vida Siempre, for life uh, forever. And uh, it was meant to be open September 11, actually, um, without knowing that that day was gonna happen something completely different. So the idea, the original idea was that um, Salvador Allende was going to go to the university to give a speech uh, to call and ask the country to go into a, a plebiscite. Mm? So he was gonna offer himself to say, okay, I understand the country is in a crisis, but I'm willing to ask the people if they want me to stay in power or not. So that was the plan uh, for that day, for exactly the same day, for September 11. So the, the people, the, the, um, the graphic designers, Victor Jara and many other people were going to be at that event. They were going to celebrate Allende and uh, they were gonna make a big festival and a big carnival and you know, to, to, to give the opportunity to the people to let Allende stay in power or not. Mm? So um, this exhibition was, the, the main piece of this exhibition was made for a group of, the, a group of five graphic designers uh, that used to be part as a full-time workers of the university and also at the same time, these, these five graphic designers were very important for the um, 
Communist Party because they were they would also producing all the propaganda that was used for the Communist Party during that period. Mm -hmm. um, so they were kind of like a celebrating that too at the same time. Um, so they created these big uh, banners or like paintings. Um, there were 18 of them and the idea that each one was basically a comment of the, the danger of going into a civil war, which was the, 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 the potential danger during that moment. Mm -hmm. Because everybody know, knew that there, there was a crisis in the country and there were some attempts of uh, coups already in the country, so they were aware, of, of course, they were aware of the situation and they were resisting that situation. <clears throat> so, as you can see, there is a picture. This is the, the actual director of the university, and, um, and the, he was like, as I said, September 9th, he was like walking around, checking that the show was getting ready, and this show actually was never opened. Mm, was never inaugurated because September 10th, all the people who were preparing the show stay. They 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 stay over that night at the university. They they didn't sleep. They they worked very hard during the whole night to prepare the the, the show, and then as we know, the coup started very early in the morning. So. The show was supposed to be inaugurated at around noon, and even Salvador Allende told everybody who was going to participate in the show to stay at their um, work positions. I don't know exactly how to translate that. Um, so they, he, he asked the people at the university to, to, to just stay there and continue what they were planning to do because he was gonna try to make it anyway. Mm, and that's why Victor Jara went to the university because he said, well, I'm doing what my president told me to do. So he went to the university and basically he, he got there and everybody stayed there that day, the, <coughs> the 11, since 11, the morning until all the militants came to, to the university and they closed down the whole, the complete campus and everybody, nobody left the school. I mean, they weren't even allowed to leave the school and they had to sleep at the university again. And then at the next day, the 12th, most of the people that were there were taken to Estadio Chile, mm, where Victor Jara finally died. Mm. Um, so what happened when they create this exhibition, is they made these um, these posters, a version of the same paintings that were on the at at the at the university, like the black and white image, right? So they also made exactly the same the same pieces in posters. Hmm? And in an edition of 500, and the idea was at the same time that the, that the show was going to be open the day September the day September 11. This poster were in a group of 18 different posters um, were sent to all the schools, all the universities universities in the country. So September 11 every university in the country got this envelope with 18 posters, which were exactly the same big paintings that were at um, U, um, UT in Santiago. And the idea was to inaugurate this show, Por la Vida Siempre, at the same time in the whole country, at once. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> If you see, basically each poster uh, would make a comment about what civil war could be. And what's interesting that 
these the, these uh, images that I'm showing now um, is the only group of 18 poster that was found only five years ago. Hmm? When the coup happened, of course, everybody in the country that received the 18 poster make them disappear. Then nobody wa wanted to keep them because it was such a dangerous document um, to be found with. So even until now, nobody have found that complete the com the complete envelope with 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 18 poster um, again. So this is the only one that somebody found five years ago, and was interesting that the the envelope was was hidden be in a in an attic in a house in Valparaiso, and the marks that you can see here, and those marks, if you see, are exactly the same marks in, in every single poster. It's because there were termites, and the termites, they, they just ate the, the complete set at the same time. Um, but for me, what's, what's, what's very interesting is, is how um, this um, this show, this project, basically never really was never really ina ina inaugurated and never really happened until now, forty years later, when uh, somebody found these posters again, and there was some energy to remake this. This, uh, this project and, and remember it the way it was and how it's connected to the life of Vic Victor Jara. Victor Jara was very um, important for this group of graphic designers. Um, my father was actually part of this uh, group of graphic designers and he, he, still rem he still remembers Victor Jara as one of, one more of, of this group of people working Intensely working, preparing this um, big event for for Salvador Allende to go to to the university to to ask the country to to call for uh, for the plebiscite. And uh, at the same time, what was also very interesting, which is it became kind of like a a, a way of working and during dictatorship. That is. Um, um, how to use many, many uh, very um, simple and small resources to create something that it has a great, great impact, which is this idea of um, sending by envelope, all, almost like similar to the idea of mail art. Hmm? Uh, sending by mail these 18 posters in one envelope, but at the same time to the whole country and have the, the idea and to plan this idea of opening a show at once, you know, in the in the whole country, which is a very, very simple thing to do, but very, very smart. And then during dictatorship became very important because it, it was a very subversive gesture, you know, to do things like the what Kada did in the in the when we saw the, the sign of no more. They are very connected, like a gestures of how to intervene um, or how to use very simple ways, like a, the, the like the the post or or to hang something in the street, like a but but with this great great effect that it it, it takes um, some kind of kind of artistic skill to make it happen is 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 that's the uh, for me that's the that's the piece when when as an artist you you find those very small niches to to create something that it gives uh, such an uh, important um, effect um, so now at the same time I'll be very very short uh, at the same time um, that I'm showing this, and we are exhibiting the piece, my piece about Victor Jara here. There is another show happening in New York, which is at, at the Guggenheim. That is a show about 
recent art from Latin America, <clears throat> where I'm also showing a piece, but at the same time, uh, I asked the curator if it were possible to recreate this piece, the original posters, to show at that, at, at this other venue, because somehow it's connected, and there has never been like a international exposure to this uh, to this project. So the the um, it was the, the idea was very well received, and um, but there was there was a, a like we were thinking what it will be the best way to show this project again, and not to turn it into a piece of fine art, because it's never been the idea of, of a project like this. Um, so the, what, what was interesting is to, to think and to go back to the idea of, of the posters that were sent to the whole country, and, but remake the posters in the shape of um, postcards. Mm? So, um, so once again, like after, 40 years, now the piece is being shown again, but now here in New York at the Guggenheim, and, uh, but in the, in the shape of, of only as postcards. And the, and the idea is that people can buy them for a, a very low price, just keeping the same spirit of the original work, and they can just keep them or they can just resend them again as, a, as a posters. So. Um, I think it's clear. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Ivan. And um, I'm um, just while it's fresh on everybody's mind, there are kind of three things going on that folks have made announcements about. So let's just go ahead and and make sure that everybody heard. Estreita, would you mind telling us about your uh, the event tomorrow evening? Tell us where it is. And tomorrow evening, we'll be at the Institute of Fine Arts, um, NYU, uh, New York University's Institute of Fine Arts on 78th, uh, just off of 5th. And it's going to be a symposium with speakers uh, speaking on um, Lodi Rosenfeld by Jason Dubbs. Uh, Joaquim uh, will be speaking on um, Kamnitzer, Luis Kamnitzer. And Claudia, I believe, will be uh, a commentator at the end on Brazilian art, uh, as well as myself. So uh, it's from 6 to 8 p.m. So anybody who's interested, I can send the, 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 the link. So, OK, thank you. And Ivan, do you want to tell us about the show? or? Um, or should I, I have the, the title and I know when it ends, I should do it, okay. Um, so the, the, the show that at the Guggenheim that Ivan was just referring to is called Under the Same Sun, Art from Latin America Today, and it's on through October 1st. So I still have much of the month to go see it, um, please do. And it's a collaboration with, I believe, something like 40 artists are involved in yeah. the show. Okay. So pretty, pretty amazing. Um, and, um, and also the exhibition that we're here uh, in commemoration um, today um, closes on Friday, as I said, and the gallery hours are from one to five, um, Monday through Friday. So for those of you who haven't had a chance to see it, um, please, you're, you're welcome and you still have time. Um, so and I'm sorry, Lydia, and I think that Ivan also brought postcards uh, oh, yes. to sell. Um, oh, um, if okay. anybody's interested, I have some postcards in the, in the table right here. To buy. To buy, <laughs> yes, for a very low price. <laughs> so before, before, um, before we get going, I um, wanted to see if we had any questions or any themes that resonate. Um, most certainly, there's a lot that's been shared and that we've learned from our panelists. So any questions or comments or concerns and just, um, um, sorry, concerns fell out. I'm a professor, so, <laughs> um, so there are there are microphones um, that you can uh, line up behind, um, or if you feel um, like you can project, they they're not working. I see. Okay, so please use the microphones if you wish to ask a question. 
um, or make a comment. <laughs> Feedback. <laughs> Feedback? I have a question for you, Bonnie. Those images from the postcards, who were the artists? Were they the, just the professor, or was it the five graphic artists, or were they outside artists? No, it just the, the graphic designers. They design it. They, yeah, they did everything. Even the, the text is mm -hmm. original from them. From them? Yeah. It yeah. wasn't sort of an interesting. No, no, they invented it. Hi, so I'm interested in this idea of being a, a, a direct witness or a secondhand witness, you know, and, and Yvonne, in your work, um, because you were very young and um, the incident that your work is about with Hada, you sort of experienced secondhand. I'm curious how, what kind of, if you felt any kind of burden in terms of where you got your information from, if it was fine, if it came from one source, if you were looking at several sources, if you were talking with your father, friends of your father, how, what kind of burden did you feel in terms of being a secondhand witness to the event? Um, yeah, well, that is actually something that I, I try to recreate or try to understand through my work, um, which is, Basically, why I was interested in the in the piece uh, written by Victor Jara during the during the the, the time he was at the this uh, concentration camp, because it is an unfinished poem basically, and this work for me was trying to not finish the actual idea or the original idea of Victor Jara, but trying to understand the feeling, trying to recreate the idea of what he was living at the same time, or basic, or trying to make a song of it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, yeah, so it's, 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 I mean, personally, it's, it's, for me, it's very complicated to understand exactly how was the time during dictatorship, because I was, I was uh, very young, but um, but I, I I do that through my work. I, I always try to trying to understand the political situation through the work, and and it's something very fictional at the same time mm, because it plays with both mm, with this uh, with this illusion. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Good evening. My name is uh, Rafaelina Tineo, and I am an artist. And what I want to say or comment is um, I want to thank you um, for creating this amazing uh, panel. As an artist, answering your question, I think through a work of art, um, this is a very inspiring uh, line of work that I pursue myself. We're not just uh, creating um, and, and recording history through a work of art but we also creating awareness. And it's important to create awareness and to create a dialogue between the, the audience uh, um, that are uh, not knowledgeable or knowledgeable of what they're appreciating um, when they view in the work. So that's what I wanna say, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming. And I think that's a wonderful wrap up to, um, to a really amazing panel. I want to thank our panelists. What I want to, to mention is that this is truly an interdisciplinary and multicultural um, showing. Um, we have uh, sociology, um, philosophy, art history, art, photography, and more um, represented here on the panel and several different continents, um, which is pretty exciting. Um, we also have lots of different institutions, John Jay among them, CUNY system, um, as well as others that I'm not gonna go into a long list mentioning. But I do wanna thank everybody for being here, and I wanna especially thank Marina um, for doing lots of legwork and, um, and emailing and so on and so forth to make this happen.